Hey everyone, welcome back to this week's episode of Console. In this week's episode, we're actually going to build off of the previous episode, which I did not plan at all, uh, but it worked out quite nicely. Um, so in the previous episode, we looked at Bloom filters and how you could implement them on the client side uh, in order to do like full text search engine on a static website. Um, it just so happens that the blog author of this particular post that we're gonna be going over mentions that same blog from 2013 and uh, says that it's an inspiration for what they're trying to do in this particular blog post. And basically what they've done is they've taken that approach, they productionalized it and made it a little bit more modern because they end up using WebAssembly in order to build the, uh, the Bloom filter, the search engine, if you will, um, using Rust. So what they did is they wrote a, a Rust package that compiles into Wasm and then uh, the Wasm library they actually use generates the JavaScript for them, so they don't have to write any JavaScript in order to search into the... They use a cuckoo filter instead of a bloom filter, but that was only because uh, the bloom filter library in Rust uh, doesn't serialize and they needed that in order to make the searches into it. Um, so yeah, yeah, this post was super, uh, super interesting, uh, super... It was a lot more modern than the previous post. Um, and it fit extremely nicely. I, I really didn't plan that, but it worked out quite nice that uh, this post would come immediately after the one before it. Um, so without further ado, let's jump right in. So this is the blog post we'll be going over. It's written by Matthias Endler. You can see uh, his URL is endler.dev. And uh, in fact, I didn't realize this when I was, uh, when I actually flagged this blog post to like look into it, but um, he got the idea from the previous video, with the, the one that we went through with the Bloom filters. Uh, he thought, could I do the same thing using Web, WebAssembly? Uh, because kind of one thing that gets mentioned in the previous blog post is that it's not easy to get this Bloom filter running on the client side. And so he was thinking, can I do the same thing here with the WebAssembly? Now that WebAssembly is available. Back in two thir 2013, when the previous blog post was written, uh, it wasn't available, so let's try and do the same thing with WebAssembly. And turns out you can do that. Um, so what he does is he write, writes the same code. It, he doesn't. He uses a cuckoo filter instead of a Bloom filter, but he writes it in Rust, and then uh, uses WebAssembly, and then queries into that WebAssembly in JavaScript. Uh, so briefly at the very beginning of the video, you saw me testing out. So while we were doing that, running those uh, searches on the top left part of his page that's actually the module that we're going to be uh, creating ourselves in this particular tutorial so uh, this video doesn't actually have a lot of coding actually because so I read through the blog post thinking okay there's gonna be a bunch of code here to follow but uh, there's not actually he, he's actually packaged it up on a github and we'll end up using that github code uh, to actually create this same search search module on like my own localhost server uh, and, and make some queries on some fake test data. I did the same thing as the previous video where I just generated a bunch of fake blog posts and we query them. Um, one thing I did want to call out though is he, he points to these two other uh, JavaScript libraries that handle the searching, like client-side searching for you so you don't have to like write your own WebAssembly in order to do the same thing. Um, if there's interest, see I, I wasn't aware of these libraries previous to this video um, which you know if I was going to do a project and I needed to do a like, client-side searching I would actually probably just use one of these libraries to be honest um, but yeah if, there, if there's interest in in like more of this search search engine related stuff uh, I'll definitely do tutorials or I guess I shouldn't call them tutorials episodes on on uh, Elastic Lunar and Lunar itself for now though we're, we're, we're going to keep following his blog post, and uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, I'd never coded in Rust before. Not that I did any coding in Rust in this particular case, but I did have to like create a Rust environment so that I could pull down his package um, and build out the WebAssembly as well. So uh, here's where he talks about the blog post from 2013. I believe I said in the previous episode something along the lines of, you know, this if, if this blog post is still getting, is it still floating around the tech blog sphere uh, from all the way back as far as 2013 it was obviously you know an influential blog post so I, I'm really glad we went through it because I mean we're seeing it here right he's taking the same exact idea uh, with the bloom filters and just applying them with new technologies where whereby now we have WebAssembly we can 
try and like compose this functionality into a library that we can still use in the front end. So right here what he talks about is he basically took the Python code from the 2013 tutorial and uh, ported it over to Rust. Uh, but the problem was he wasn't able to get the Rust code running in the front end until he says WebAssembly came along and he was like, hey, maybe I could take this blog post I did back from 2018 and, you know, mash it together with WebAssembly and maybe have this thing running on the client side and in fact it works. So right here is where he's talking about um, he couldn't really find a Bloom filter that would do client side like serialization. Um, and so he ended up using a cuckoo filter instead, but you know, it's, they're roughly the same thing. As far as you, uh, the client is concerned, you know, you, you're going to put some things in and you're going to check if they're in the set or not. So the rest of this blog post is, um, mostly about like optimizing the, uh, WASM that gets created from the WebAssembly. So from here on out, he's mostly talking about like how they were able to cut the WASM size down for the, uh, cuckoo filter. We're not going to spend too much time talking about that um, because later on in the video I actually pull his library down and actually get that running, which I think is a little bit more interesting. Unless you're like a WASM expert or whatever, which I'm not, I'm not expecting most of the watchers of this video to be. Here's one particular uh, feature of WASM I think that, that's pretty powerful is uh, he mentions that the JavaScript code, which we'll end up using later on in the video, uh, is auto-generated by Wasm Pack for to talk to the Wasm file. So I was actually kind of like looking through that, going like, "Man, how did he write this code? How did he know how to do all this stuff?" Um, and then I real I remembered after I was scrolling through his post again after setting everything up, I was like, "Oh, that's right. The uh, Wasm Pack actually does all that for you." Right here is when I'm like, "Oh, he actually has packaged this up so that you can just use it yourself." Like I was expecting this tutorial, like the previous ones that I went through to be a lot of coding but he, he literally is packages this up you could pull this down yourself and set up a static site full text search uh, running in your browser uh, using his package here's another um, uh, text searching library that they they uh, link to in the in the blog as well uh, yet another one I can go over in the future if people are interested so uh, here's the GitHub repo, and here here's the installation steps. I'm basically just going to follow these down uh, in the video, and then actually uh, generate some fake data. You can see down here the usage is tiny search, and then the JSON file. the The JSON files have to be in a specific JSON format in order for their indexer to be able to index the data, um, which you'll see. I have a little bit of a problem later uh, doing that. In the previous video, I used Linux to just like generate a bunch of random strings because that text searcher was a little bit simpler. Uh, in this particular case, I wrote a quick little Python script to generate the JSON, but I used the same kind of approach where I was just take grabbing random uh, words out of the uh, dictionary uh, for Mac OS. So you can see my attempts up there, right? Previously in the terminal where I was trying to generate this this fake JSON data. What happened is I uh, found out that I had to install Rust and all these other things, right? And I was like, okay, well, while those are installing, I'll keep working on trying to get the uh, arbitrary JSON running. So here, here, here's the steps. Effectively, if you if you're not familiar with Rust, which I wasn't, uh, these are the steps you can run on Mac OS in order to uh, install Rust. So at this point, uh, I've installed Rust, and it comes with the p package manager for Rust, which is called Cargo. And in this at this point I'm installing one of his dependencies which is uh, Wasm Pack. At this point I switch over to like trying to get the arbitrary JSON running and I'll show a couple of little clips of some of the problems I run into doing that. So the first thing I found was this uh, library called JO which uh, can generate JSON objects. I tried GQ or sorry JQ originally. Um, it was a little bit annoying to use so then I was like okay let, let's try this other library out. It kind of worked, but then I, I realized like I was going to need a little bit more functionality inside the uh, the the word generation thing than I was expecting to get, um, which you'll see the implementation I end up using with Python. But I thought this was an interesting library, so I figured I'd show that. And this is where I finally give up and say, oh, screw it, I'm writing it in Python. Um, I'm not, I'm not totally done with the script. In fact, I literally just started writing it, right? I'm just reading from the the uh, words file that I had used in the previous video 
and at this point I'm printing the words out but I need to format them in this JSON formatted way uh, that their their um, WASM uh, binary or sorry WASM library is expecting to read the JSON text in uh, so I'm basically just creating that out of these random words I uh, title the articles based on like which chunk of the words um, we're creating here um, that way I can like ensure that the the, the bloom filter the cuckoo filter is behaving as I expect which in fact I get a bunch of false positives in this video as well which I'll point out uh, later in the video when we actually get to a state of testability okay at this point I've generated the JSON and then I'm literally just running the command it's very brief but it's in their their github repo it's just tiny search and then the directory where I put all the fake data and fake content slash index .json. Uh, I was re-watching this while I was editing the video and I realized they've got a bunch of test data in the repo. I could have just been using that all along rather than figuring out how to generate some random JSON, but uh, it was a good exercise anyway, right? Um, so one thing they mention in the in the GitHub repo is that um, after you've generated the WASM, uh, they actually provide you with a simple HTML and uh, you can spin up a quick Python server, which is what I'm doing right here, and actually hit your uh, quote-unquote search engine, your client-side search engine. It'll bring up a little HTML page, which I'll show you, and you can search for words, and they'll show up. It'll tell you which document the words um, that you're searching for are in. So Tiny Search has finished creating my search engine, basically. Um, I'm spinning up a simple H uh, Python server and going to the HTML that they've generated, the demo HTML in the repo, and I'm searching for a random word. So I search for test, nothing comes up. I'm like, what? No way. Uh, so then I check all of my fake content, and I'm like, there's got to be test somewhere in one of these uh, articles. Turns out there isn't. I had a small bug in my Python generation code, and so it wasn't generating all of the random words, it was only generating a subset of them. It never got down to the T's in this particular case. Um, this is a trick, actually. <laughs> Test isn't actually in there. Um, so I actually go through, find the, find the bug, fix it, and then we'll fast forward through the bug finding and uh, get to a point. Yeah, see, you can see here, okay, there are in fact search results being returned at this point by the search engine. And I can only because I, at that point I had grepped my article, right, my fake article at least, and make made sure there was an actual word in there that I was searching for, uh, and I got a bunch of these return values, and I was like a little bit surprised that that one word showed up so many times in all of these different articles. Some of it might have been far, false positives, but also, like I said, I had a bug in the Python generation code. Uh, for some reason, I thought I was going to be able to navigate to my article, which is absolutely stupid. So I've fixed my Python code at this point. You can see like there are full full words at the, at the in the last quote unquote article, right? That start with Z. It was one way I was testing to make sure that my Python code was working as expected. And this time around, right, I search for this word, and it shows up in three articles rather than like I don't know before there was like maybe ten, which seemed a lot more plausible to me, right? And it was actually like. I was able to verify that's like a smaller subset of articles that you can actually go through and search through and like make sure see if this word is actually showing up or not right but again I was like article zero there's no way a letter start or a word starting with letter Z is in article zero so that was how I found out that uh, indeed there were uh, false positives in this particular search engine as well right because it's using a cuckoo filter rather than a or, or a bloom filter right both of them have the potential for false positives so at this point I'm like pretty damn impressed with what they've managed to achieve in this little uh, GitHub repo. And so I'm, I'm like poking around the JSON code, like figuring out how that works, uh, figuring out how like the WASM is imported and all that stuff. Cause I've actually, most of the WASM stuff I've done was on blockchain stuff. It wasn't on the front end. So I, I was like not really sure how WASM got into the front end. So this was like super useful to learn. Uh, that sort of stuff. Again, like I, I started digging into the JSON code as well, or the JavaScript code as well, from like actually reading out of the Cuckoo filter, and I uh, was like, dude, what? How did they write all this code? Because there's like a lot of like binary parsing and pulling things out of specific indexes and binary arrays and things like that. And then, like I said, I went back to the blog post and was like, oh yeah, of course, this stuff was all generated for them. I was also kind of like looking through the repo and I didn't see this tiny search engine. 
uh, JS file anywhere in the repo. So I thought, oh, are they code generating this? Which was like even more impressive, right? It turns out it is code gen. It's not something that they wrote though. Um, but uh, this demo, this HTML demo, is uh, is in the repo, so you can look at that as well on their GitHub. Obviously, you can look at it uh, locally as well. So um, right here is the uh, the the JavaScript I was talking about before. You can see there's a lot of uh, convert string conversions and you know buffers and encoding and decoding and all that other stuff. That's everything for this week's episode. Um, this one was a very good lead up from the previous episode. It's almost, it's almost like the two authors are the same person. <laughs> like even though the content came from separate authors, um, they fit so nicely together that it's almost like they collaborated or something. And they were what, I want to say six years apart or something like that, uh, which is really mind blowing. Uh, so in the first video, it was it was useful because we went and implemented. Well, we didn't implement a bloom filter, right? But we were able to utilize a bloom filter, and we kind of saw why how we could use a bloom filter uh, for client side search engine related stuff, right? Um, and basically, what we did is we took that idea and productionalized it in this in this particular blog post. So uh, it's, it was really cool to see those ideas build on one another, how you would do it in code. And then we hardly wrote any code in this particular video other than to generate the fake um, blog posts. Uh, but we were able to, like I said, productionalize a, a, a client-side search engine building off the ideas from the previous video. Uh, that, that was a really cool. I mean, I, didn't, I certainly didn't plan it that way, um, but I'm really happy for the way that that turned out. Um, that's everything for this week's episode. I'll see you next week.